Hello! Today we're going to cover the installation of this CA6 robot. Before I do that though, I would like to talk briefly about safety. Robots get used in a wide variety of applications, but there is no one-size-fits-all safety solution because those applications can be diverse and have different requirements. This robot in particular moves quickly and with a lot of momentum, and it can inflict physical harm to people standing near it. So, it's the responsibility of the owner and the operators to follow the proper safety protocols. A typical ZA6 robot system consists of three parts. The robot itself, the electrical cabinet, and a control computer. The robot and the electrical cabinet will ship together on one small pallet, about 130 kilograms. Here we've already removed the crate, some shrink wrap, and some packaging materials. So both the robot and the electrical cabinet are fairly heavy. One person may be able to manage lifting them, but in order to protect your back, you may want to enlist the help of a friend or coworker. All right, you ready? I'm gonna take it off this yep. way. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. The robot is fastened to the pallet with a couple of threaded fasteners and a nut. Any old crescent wrench should get these removed for you. Take it off this way. Okay. Okay. And tilt it towards you. Okay. You got it? Yep. We're mounting this today to a steel table, and we're going to go ahead and drill four holes for the robot. Uh, to fasten the robot to the table. Um, this particular table is going to be good for doing demonstrations with the robot. If we move it next to a milling machine, it might work for pick and place. You want to mount it to a pretty stiff surface. So this table is probably 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. The dimensions of the base plate and the mounting holes are in the user manual. Uh, but an easy thing to do would just be to go ahead and take a Sharpie or a transfer punch and make a little mark. You want to show the holes that have been drilled? I'm using 3 8 16 fasteners here. I believe half 13 would work as well, or an equivalent metric size. The length of the fastener, of course, varies based on what you've chosen to mount the robot to. There's no real rule about how you orient the robot. I could be orienting the robot so that its base plate was pointed this direction. The one thing I will want to note is that from this orientation, this joint can rotate 180 degrees in either direction but it will not be able to cross this portion, right? So this forward can go 180 degrees that way, 180 degrees that way. It will not rotate around and around. It's kind of like an owl, I guess. So now that the robot is physically mounted, let's go ahead and plug in the electrical cabinet and we'll make the connections between the robot and the electrical cabinet. So as you can see, there are three cables coming out of the electrical cabinet. One is for power, that's 220 volt, single phase, 20 amp power. And one is for the motor encoders and one is for the motor power. Um, these two connectors are polarized. You can't screw up and put them in backwards. They really only go one way. Press firmly and snap. Outside of just requiring 220 volt single phase at 20 amps, you really want this to be clean power. So it should not be sharing a circuit with a noisy hard start electric motor like an air compressor or a drill press or anything like that. Um, if that's not possible, you'll want to make the computer power connections to a separate 110 volt circuit. 
This little uh, attached baggie contains four extra M12 connectors uh, if you want to wire up your own inputs or outputs to the system. So we've got the control computer set up here. Um, the computer itself, keyboard, mouse, cabling, touchscreen monitor. So setting up the computer is like you would set up any other computer. USB devices go into the USB ports on the computer itself. There's USB 2 on the back, USB 3 on the front. Doesn't really matter for a keyboard and a mouse, uh, but if you wanted to, you could put your faster USB devices on the USB 3 inputs. The computer only has an HDMI output, so you'll be using the HDMI cable to connect the monitor to the computer. Lastly, both the monitor and the computer come with um, a power cord that is appropriate for plugging into a standard 120 volt outlet. Um, you can certainly power the computer and the monitor that way. Your other option is to use the 240 volt accessory outputs on the robot cabinet itself. Uh, to do that, you'll need uh, a power cord from Tormach with this style of connector. The uh, last step in connecting the control computer to the robot is to wire uh, this CAT6 Ethernet cable from the network connection on the control computer to the EtherCAT input on the electrical cabinet. And you'll hear me say two words that sound a lot alike, Ethernet and EtherCAT. EtherCAT is a field bus. It's a network protocol. It runs on an Ethernet network. So the robot uses EtherCAT to define the little packets that go back and forth between the robot and the computer. All of that goes back and forth over standard network hardware using CAT6 Ethernet cable. And I've brought this control computer up to show you. There are two network ports. You're gonna to wanna to choose number one for the robot and port number two for a wired network if you're plugging into uh, like a, a switch or a router to access the internet. Uh, that's actually pretty important. You can run the machine without an internet connection, but to have access to automatic software updates, to have access to our technical support documentation and our user forums through the computer, you really wanna have it network connected. So the computer has Wi-Fi on board, it has an extra local area network port. Uh, highly recommend wiring it in to your network or at a minimum connecting it to Wi-Fi so that you have access to those tools. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the safety of a robot installation is highly dependent on what you're gonna use the robot for. Um, we're using this robot just to demonstrate how to install a robot. So our safety procedure is gonna be limited to plugging in an external e-stop so that the operator can remotely e-stop the robot from a safe distance away, and also configuring the one necessary safety input. Uh, in our case, I just have a light curtain that we're gonna plug in. We'll show you how it works, how it plugs in. But obviously this installation is not great for a light curtain. I could approach the robot from this side, from that side, from all over. Typically, you're gonna have a robot that's gonna be you know, against a wall, up against a corner, um, caged on two or three sides, you might use that light curtain for that fourth exposed side to prevent an operator from getting anywhere close to the robot without the robot going into a safe state. Um, we also sell a safety switch. Uh, there are pressure mats available, not from Tormach yet. Uh, basically, any device that can plug into a PNP input would be appropriate, and we can show you how to wire those in another video. All of our robots and many of our machine tools have an input for an auxiliary e-stop. This would be an e-stop that you can move to a remote location. Um, the robot itself has a primary e-stop and a power on switch uh, reset button here. But if you, um, 
if you need to have uh, the operator have access elsewhere, um, you can plug in a, a remote e-stop box. And our e-stop boxes are wired the same regardless of the device. So I actually have an e-stop box from an 8L lathe here that I'm going to use for the robot demonstration today. But um, any of the Tormach remote e-stop should work for this. So I have one more safety device to install here, and that is uh, the actual device that's going to plug into our safety input. Um, in this case, I'm going to use a light curtain, um, but you could use a safety switch. Um, anything that will trip a, a PNP input would work. Um, the last digital input on the robot has two channels, one for a safety device that must be closed for the robot to move, another for a hold to run device. And we can show both of those in detail in another video. And for now, I'm going to leave this device disconnected. I'm going to go ahead and power on the system. We'll take a look at the state of the inputs. We'll plug the device in. We'll verify that that safety input is acting the way it's supposed to. And then we'll move the robot around. If we've connected everything correctly, um, turning the rotary disconnect on in our electrical cabinet should apply power to the cabinet and turn on the control computer. So when the system first powers on, you're going to see the desktop and a PathPilot Robot Edition icon. You're going to double click that and it'll bring up the software. I'm going to go ahead here and start up the software. It'll automatically check to see if there's an update available and it'll ask you if you want to download it. And we're just going to go ahead and start this version. Now you should be shown at least one non-simulation configuration. If your EtherCAT connection isn't complete, you will only see the ZA6 simulation configuration. So if you only see one and it says simulation, you're going to want to double check the connections between the computer and the electrical cabinet to make sure that the EtherCAT cable is plugged in correctly and to make sure the electrical cabinet has power. So because we have not plugged in that safety device, you can see that uh, the max velocity here is showing a red 10%, uh, meaning it won't move. And the safety input here uh, is not showing a green LED. And that means, you know, as we knew, we've got to connect the safety input. So this is an M12 connector. So these connectors, they're five pin connectors. The, um, they're pretty neat. This uh, center threaded piece will rotate as the pin stays stationary. And all the robots, digital inputs and outputs go through M12 connectors. The safety input goes to the last input in the electrical cabinet. Obviously, uh, this setup is temporary and it's just for the purposes of this install video. But we've got our light curtain set up and it's plugged into the safety input on the robot. There are two ways that you can check to see if this is working. One way is um, you can actually see a green light on one of the two um, light curtain devices on the transceiver. And so you can see when I pass my hand in front of it, that green light turns to red. Uh, the other way we can tell that the safety input is wired in and working correctly is that um, here the last input is showing a green LED next to it here on our software. A system that's installed with a functioning safety input to power on the device, you would turn the rotary disconnect on the electrical cabinet to the on position to power up the drives and to apply power to the control computer. You'd launch the control software. When the control software is up and running, we'll take the machine out at e-stop. You do that by making sure that both this auxiliary e-stop and this e-stop are in the out position. And then you can press either this blue reset button or this blue reset button. If the button stays illuminated, you know that both these stops are out. If you've accidentally got an e-stop in, you'll see this button will illuminate momentarily, but won't stay illuminated. Last step is to establish communication between the control software and the robot by clicking the flashing reset button on the screen. 
When you get to this stage, even though your robot was QC'd at our factory uh, before it was shipped to you, um, it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and jog each joint individually. We do have a quick tip video on how to jog the robot and a series of quick tip videos on how to use the user interface and how to program the robot and how to get started, as well as a training manual for the robot. So uh, at this phase, the installation is complete, uh, but it wouldn't hurt to start exploring things by moving each joint individually, teaching a few waypoints, and running a simple program. Thank you so much for watching our ZA6 installation video.